All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's collaborative mentoring webinar series. We'll be featuring a preview of the themes and some of the research fellows who will be participating in the Summer Institute for Youth Mentoring next week in Portland. The uh, 2012 Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series is a partnership between all the organizations that you see listed below. Um, I'm April Reardon, the Director of Training and Community Partnerships for the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota. Uh, the way we manage the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, especially with so many different partners, is that uh, different mentoring providers take the lead and, and uh, uh, provide some leadership for each month. So this month, um, supporting the webinar, we have Sarah Kremer with Friends for Youth. She'll be uh, handling any questions uh, from you uh, as, our, as our attendees. Uh, Mike Geringer will be our moderator and will be in charge of interviewing our research fellows and, and panelists. And Marissa Strayer-Benton is joining us for Mobius Mentors and she will be um, chatting with you in the in the chat panel. So between Sarah and Marissa, um, you know, any questions or uh, comments that you have to make, feel free to share those in that panel, and I'll um, show that on the next slide. Uh, really can't emphasize Hello. enough that yes, Hello, this is Sarah. I'm just yes. gonna jump in. We don't see any slides right now. Can you share them, please? Oh, sure. There we go. Thank you. Perfect. And there wasn't anything terribly interesting right before this slide, but here's all of us. There's Sarah, Mike, Marissa, and myself, April Reardon. Uh, just some things that are good to know. Um, we often get questions about this, but you will, after the webinar, receive an email with some instructions about how to access a PDF of the presentation slides and also a webinar recording. We do record the webinars and those will be available. Um, also a link to the mentoring forums. Um, these are part of the National Mentoring Center at Education Northwest. Uh, but you can go there and we'll post any additional resources, contact information, other things that come up um, during the webinar. And also it provides a chance to continue the dialogue. So if we end up, we get lots of questions. There's lots of people participating. And if any of your questions are unanswered, you can post them there and we'll encourage you know, all of our partners and then uh, panelists to take a peek and, and answer those if we can. Uh, at the end of the webinar, as you exit, there is a short five survey, uh, five question survey that if you can answer that, that would uh, respond to that. It really helps us out and helps us improve the webinar series. Um, okay. Uh, participating in the webinar, just so you know, all attendees are muted for best sound. We had uh, 180 folks register for the webinar so far. We've got about half of those already logged in. Uh, so we're up to 90 and I'm sure we'll get more as we move along. So all attendees are muted just for the best sound. Uh, you can type questions and comments in the question panel on your control panel. Um, I don't think we're doing the raise your hand piece today so you don't really have to worry about that. But we really want this to be a participatory experience, a chance for you to interact with these uh, great experts who are sharing their time with us and also with your peers. Uh, again, Sarah and, and Marissa will be um, monitoring the questions that are entered there and either reposting your question or comment to the rest of the group or um, they'll be queuing up those questions and waiting for moments where they can jump in and ask those questions of the panelists. Um, and we might have other things where we just ask for some comments about different things and, and feel free to enter those. Uh, to find out more about you and get a sense of who's with us on the webinar today, we do have a couple of polls. So I'm going to go ahead, launch the first one. Um, just to figure out, we'd like to start everyone and find out what the experience level is uh, of those who are participating. So kind of would you describe yourself as an expert, experienced in the field of mentoring, or a beginner?
And I'll give it a few more seconds and then we'll share. Okay. It's, this is about, we usually have mostly folks who describe themselves as experienced on the webinars. It seems like this is a slightly bigger group of maybe beginners and um, maybe a little bit, a little bit more on the, the beginner and expert, fewer who are describing themselves as experienced. Maybe it's all the returning webinar participants who have decided they have a new category. Uh, and we are our second poll to find out again a little bit more about you would be, so now we know the experience level, but what your role is uh, with mentoring or with your mentoring program. So um, do you work as a, in a direct service mentoring program? Are you doing more training and technical assistance for mentoring programs? Are you a researcher? And our hope is always that maybe a funder will, will come on in. Um, and then other, if you select other, feel free to enter those into the um, into that question panel or the chat panel so that um, we can see who else is here. Okay. I give me about 30 seconds to do this. So, and we'll share. So most of you are working in mentoring programs. And so we hope that you'll have some good um, takeaways from today's webinar. Um, training and technical assistance, um, a good chunk. And then we do have uh, a funder, some researchers, and some, some other roles, but mostly um, direct service mentoring program providers. So that's helpful to know. Again, we had 180 uh, people registered for the webinar. Right now we're over 100 attendees. So uh, without further ado, let's get, <laughs> get moving and talk about um, today's topic hide that. Um, so this is just a rundown. We're just going to um, hear a little about about what is the Summer Institute on Youth Mentoring for those who are unfamiliar with that. Uh, the Summer Institute theme, just to hear from uh, Tom Keller about how they selected the theme and, and, and what that's all about. And then we will jump into this panel discussion with our research fellows, practitioners, and, and our, our panelists. Um, we have a lot of panelists today, and um, we have questions that we're prepared to ask them, but um, Q&A is welcome throughout the presentation. So you can start entering those questions at any time. If you've done your homework and looked at who was participating and have questions that you want to ask them, um, please do that. But the Summer Institute on Youth Mentoring is held at Portland State University. It kicks off next Monday. Um, and so before you learn too much about it, maybe we'll just, we have one more poll to find out who of our participants have already attended the Summer Institute on Youth Mentoring. So have you attended the SIM in the past? Sometimes it gets called SIM. For our partners, who in the collaborative webinar series, maybe you can, you don't get to vote in the poll as an organizer or staff, but I have been there twice, two summers for the Summer Institute. Anybody else want to share? Uh, well, this is Sarah. I've been there, I think, almost every year. I, I missed one year, and I think we were thinking about adding another response here to this question of, <laughs> no, I haven't been accepted yet. <laughs> Pay attention to my application next year, Tom. <laughs> you can mention those things in the in the panel, and we can make sure to get those comments <laughs> over to Tom. But 14% of our attendees, so we're talking over 100, so that's a pretty good chunk of the group who has attended um, the Summer Institute, uh, but 86% no. So you'll find out more about it today and see if it's something you want to look into um, in the future. In the chat panel, though, maybe you do um, to mention if you are attending next week. That might be um, good to know and maybe make some connections here. All right. Well, now, after all of that introduction, I'm going to hand over to Mike Geringer, who's with the National Mentoring Center at Education Northwest. He's our moderator for today, but I think he'll um, kick us off by asking Tom some questions about the Summer Institute.
and Mike. Well, we'll figure that out. Mike, it looks like you are unmuted and ready to go. But I don't say, uh, Mike was going to ask Tom just to talk a little bit about the Summer Institute on Youth Mentoring historically, um, and especially some of the ways that folks around the country who are not attending can access the research and ideas being presented. All right, Tom, Mike, you guys are unmuted. Let's see. Looks like everybody's connected to audio. Sorry, everybody. Muted. Um, is anybody able to to talk right now? Mike, Tom. This is Sarah. This is Sarah. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, well, while we're waiting, if you have questions, please submit them, and and I'll start getting them in order. All right. I'm not seeing anything from Mike or from Tom. I wonder if they can hear. Of course, everything was fine just before. <laughs> we were chatting with everybody. Maybe they had an electrical storm in Portland. Uh, yeah, is there something suspicious that they're both in Portland right now? Um, I don't know if you guys can chat something to us. Let us know what's up. Sure, Mike, if you want to try to call back in. I, yeah, I can't hear anything. Hand is up here, Becca. All right. Not sure what happened to Tom either. Everything looks fine on my end. I'm not sure what I can do. Um, I don't know, Sarah. Do you want to share a little bit about the Summer Institute on Youth Mentoring or your experience with it? I can also show, go over and show the the website a little bit. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, and Rebecca Holbrook says she's attending next week. She's looking forward to it. Um, that's It's fantastic. It's an amazing week of, of really absorbing as much as you can about mentoring and learning so much about research as well. Um, Tom does a really great session at the beginning to it's kind of like a whole semester's worth of of a research and statistics class in about an hour. So um, it's something to get used to. Uh, I feel like now that I'm going into my, I think it's my fifth year attending, I think I am a little more informed about statistics and I'm understanding more from the researchers every year. Um, it's, it's really an amazing opportunity also to network and to uh, learn what other programs are doing across the country. Sometimes some of the best sharing comes about in informal settings or um, when someone has a question and other programs, other program staff can share how they handle that kind of situation. So um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be invited back every year, and I'm excited for next week. And I hope everyone gets to hear about it. I hope we're going to get them reconnected soon. I think Mike is on. Mike, can we hear you now? Can you there. hear me now, April? I sure can. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I had to call back in. All right. I'm not sure what the issue was with that. Yeah, I'm not sure yet with Tom either, so I just sent him a message. But we we'll just keep going, and we can always get to the um, get to the panelists then too. Um, just checking one more time to see Tom, are you here at all? And Mike, do you want to share a little bit about uh, your role at the Summer Institute and your previous summaries of different research, and mention maybe sure. where people can go. To find them. Sure, yeah. No, I've been uh, participating in the Summer Institute uh, since it launched uh, several years ago. Um, and my role has been kind of working with Tom um, to kind of write up a nice summary of the event. Obviously, it's kind of an exclusive event. It's not you know, a huge number of participants um, every year. So uh, it's kind of a limited opportunity to, to kind of be there for the full week. And so what I've tried to do is work with him and the other research fellows 
um, that come from year to year. Um, and, and kind of write up a summary article about that year's theme, about the research that was presented, um, and, and kind of wrapping it all up in a nice package so that people that weren't able to attend can kind of understand, you know, what was presented and kind of the ideas that are, are percolating out of it. Um, you can find all of those summaries on the Summer Institute website. There's a section on there called the Learning Hub, and that not only has uh, links to each of those summary articles kind of organized by year, um, but it also um, it provides, starting last year, they, they were filming some video. Um, so there's video clips of uh, several of the researchers presenting um, some of their, their thoughts and ideas and, and findings. So there's a really like a wealth of information up on there. Um, and this year I'll be doing the same thing again. I'll be working with each of the research fellows to kind of summarize what they presented and kind of wrap it up into a, a nice summary article. I think we're going to get Tom back here in just a second, but um, looks like he's going to call back in. He was on a mic and some speakers too, but um, anything you want to say about the theme right off the bat? Or I mean, we've got the slide here. I think we'll have him jump into how we selected the theme, but once we get well, him here. I think, you know, for, I think for this year, I mean, uh, last year's theme was around mentoring for youth at transition points. Tom, you back? Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know why I got cut off. I could hear you, but... Yeah, something okay. weird was going on. Okay. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we can go back and say if there's anything you wanted to say in general about historically about the Summer Institute um, for Youth Mentoring, or we can jump right into um, this year's theme. No, it's probably better to have uh, participants speak about it than <laughs> I'm cutting it myself. <laughs> so we can move right along. Okay. Well, we've got the, the slide up now just that talks about that each um, each sim has a different theme. And then to tell us a little bit about um, this year's theme. Or, Mike, you have a, a question about it too, right? Yeah. So, Tom, I kind of was hoping that, you know, you could explain for the audience a little bit just kind of the general idea behind the Summer Institute, um, kind of that researcher-practitioner dialogue. And I know you're also increasingly trying to bring in policy people and, and funders and things into the conversation as well. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about kind of just the overall approach of the Institute, um, but then specifically this year's theme, like how did you arrive at it and, and kind of um, what, what sparked your interest around this year's theme? Right. Well, with the Summer Institute, we really wanted to provide an opportunity for advanced mentoring professionals to have um, a high level of professional development uh, opportunities uh, where they could interact directly with the researchers and we try to keep it small intentionally so that everybody can be on a first name basis um, and really participate in the discussion and um, we give the researchers plenty of time to delve into their research so that it's, it's getting beyond the headlines so that uh, the participants really understand what was involved in the, in the studies and, and what implications can be drawn from them. And um, also I think it's great for everybody to get away from the office for a full week to, to really um, put aside the day-to-day -day issues and, and, and think more deeply about the, the fun part of the job, which is program development. So we um, try to select people from around the country that um, have been in the field for a number of years and have leadership roles in their programs so that they can go back and, and use what they've learned in making changes to their programs. And uh, this year we have participants representing 20 different states as well as two provinces in Canada and um, someone from New Zealand too. So it's a great mix of, of people. And every year we organize it around a certain theme. And uh, this year we are focusing on innovative and non-traditional models of, of mentoring. And uh, that's an exciting one for me because I, it was, I think exactly 20 years ago, the summer of 92, that I started in what most people think of when, when it comes to youth mentoring. I uh, was, became a, a case manager in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program in Seattle. And, um, you know, back then it was one of the only games in town for mentoring. And um, since then, there's been a, a real explosion in different uh, 
forms of, of mentoring and the, the different ways that mentoring um, has been used to support youth. And um, I recently established a center on interdisciplinary mentoring research, which looks at mentoring across the life course. And, and that's taken me into areas like uh, mentoring for college students, mentoring in the workplace. And uh, you know, it seems like all the time I'm hearing about um, new models, new approaches. And we are now getting some really great research that um, looks at those uh, new approaches. And um, I think this is going to broaden the discussion in the field of mentoring, because um, for so long, research on programs like Big Brothers Big Sisters really provided the only guidance we had in, in terms of, of research evidence to think about best practices. But um, with the emergence of these new programs and the research on them, I, I think that will um, expand the discussion and, and um, encourage us to think more broadly about the field of mentoring and, and be more inclusive of it. Um, one great example is uh, Sandy Christensen, who will be uh, at the Summer Institute. For the past 20 years, she's been doing work on Check and Connect, which um, was established as a, a program to retain students in school, and um, they have staff who uh, monitor progress, you know, attendance and grades and stuff on a weekly basis, but also then form a, a, a personal relationship with particular students who need that kind of extra support and guidance, and, and also reach out to their families. And um, she said, after all this time, I've finally realized that, that really what we're doing is a structured mentoring program. So there is great research um, on programs that, that may fall under the heading of, of mentoring, and we can also learn from that. So um, I'm excited about having a discussion about how we can um, incorporate these new models and the new research. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's always where the most interesting things in any field are, are happening, whether it's, you know, medicine or or what, uh, you know, it's, it's people that are kind of pushing the envelope a little bit and, and trying out some new ideas. Um, but I think you're right in that the challenge is, you know, how can programs that are not necessarily doing that model, that maybe doing something a little more traditional, what can they take away from that? Um, and to that end, I kind of want to dive into um, some of our other panelists. Um, do we have George and, and Greg with us? No, perhaps yeah, not. Yes, we do. Um, we do. We just need to unmute people. That's all. Ah, okay. I'm here. This is George. George, how are you? Um, I'm doing well. I wanted to start with, with you and Greg and talking about the, the Blue Ribbon uh, Mentor Advocate Program. And the reason I kind of want to start with you all is um, in David Dubois' meta-analysis that came out late last year, um, he had identified kind of some, some moderators of, of program impact. Um, and one of those was that he found that in this meta-analysis, the programs that had put mentors in a little bit of a, a coaching or advocacy role, um, you know, that that kind of predicted the, the strength of their outcomes. Um, and, you know, I remember reading that thinking, wow, that's really interesting, but what does that mean? <laughs> what does that advocacy uh, kind of look like in action? I mean, we all think of mentors as being, you know, in their young person's corner, so to speak. But um, you all have really intentionally in Blue Ribbon built um, advocacy in as like as a much deeper, I think, concept in the program. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, maybe Greg can chime in and talk about how that looks in, in the program itself. Um, and then George, you know, in your research, you know, kind of what are you unearthing about what that advocacy brings to the table for the young people being served? Great. Go, Greg. All right. So um, our program was conceived of as a mentor advocate program because we're run through a local school system. Um, our mentors work in the way a lot of community-based mentors do in that they spend time with their mentees outside of school hours in the public one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but our mentors are also trained to work with parents on school advocacy, and the parents are trained as well. So, for instance, every mentor and parent are required to uh, 
go to two parent-teacher conferences together each year. They're required to sit down and review report cards with the student when report cards come home. And we do a lot of advocacy workshops and training uh, for them throughout the duration of their mentoring relationship. And then on another level, we also do systemic advocacy. So we're, our program is part of our district's efforts to uh, close the racial achievement gaps. And um, so we advocate for policy and practice changes within the school districts and even at state and national levels that will help students of color, including those in our program. The, the, our research on the, uh, the advocacy part of the program shows it's remarkably effective. The, the, me the mentors actually do deliver on uh, working with the parents and going to uh, parent teachers association or parent teacher meetings. Um, they are part of um, uh, events that the family thinks are important with the schools and in the community. Um, what Greg didn't mention that's in our interviews is that the Blue Ribbon staff uh, appear in all of our interviews as people who step in when the parents felt they needed someone to kind of walk them through some things. Um, the Blue Ribbon also has, a, in this last year, a new uh, initiative called the Parent University, which really prepares parents to take on this uh, advocacy role in a much more well, much more direct and informed way, a, a way of navigating uh, the system, if you would. Um, what we would say is that it's interesting that the advocacy does seem to have effects at key decision points, at least according to the, to the folks we've talked to. Um, but we're not seeing it actually working in the instructional program, and Greg and I have talked about this several times. Um, <clears throat> advocacy works, it keeps the kids from getting, from the key decision points, affecting kids like an uh, IEP decision gets affected in certain ways or a discipline decision. Um, but the school system actually doesn't know how to build on this. So the instructional program is not as responsive as we would like in these situations. On the other hand, the, you know, 95% of the kids go to college. So something's happening through Blue Ribbon. Advocacy is affecting key decision points, but, it's, but we're still not quite able to articulate the school system's direct instructional program. Sure. Um, yeah, I know I was looking at some of the outcomes of Blue Ribbon, and, and one of the things that also jumped out to me is that uh, like 60% of the graduates have had the same mentor from fourth grade through high school. Um, that's a tremendous amount of longevity, and I think it speaks to the trust that you're able to build between the parents and the mentor advocates. Um, so you mentioned a little bit of training for mentors on how to fill this advocate role. How did, how did you all develop that training? Um, did you draw on anything that other programs that want to build this in could also draw from? Um, well, our mentors receive a very extensive pre-match training. They do 12 hours, and about uh, two and a half or three hours of that is focused on uh, school advocacy. And then the um, families also receive an orientation that's a two-hour orientation. and about half of that is on advocacy. The advocacy work that we do with them uh, really, I think, started from learning from special education advocates um, and from some of the independent nonprofit organizations that train parents on how to, to advocate within that system. But we're, of course, working with families that include kids who receive special education services but also um, have a lot of other issues. And so another uh, place where we've gotten a lot of uh, guidance and, and learned a lot is from a lot of the anti-racist advocates and how do we help our parents and our mentors navigate um, the issues, the, the institutional issues that impact racial achievement gaps. Sure. All right. Thanks. Um, you know, I want to turn things over to, uh, to Mark Eddy now, if we could get Mark unmuted here, because um, I wanted to talk also, you know, kind of building on this idea of kind of uh, more intensive long-term mentoring with a lot of advocacy, a lot of connections to other services and things. Um, Mark has been studying uh, Friends of the Children. He's the principal investigator of their, their NIH-funded uh, random trial, which is kind of really looking at the long-term impact of uh, the Friends of the Children program. And Mark, I was wondering if you could 
um, just kind of briefly explain for folks who don't know kind of what the Friends of the Children model is, and then, you know, in your research, kind of what are you unearthing, and what are some ideas that other programs could maybe take away from how they approach mentoring? And Mark, I think that you're going to have to unmute yourself. So whatever you did to mute yourself, now you're going to have to unmute yourself. Hello, Mark. <laughs> well, sorry oh. for the technical difficulties, everyone. Was that, did I hear? So, no. Hmm. Well, we'll come, we'll come back to Mark here in a minute. Um, you know, I think all of our panelists here today are, are working with or studying programs that are really um, coming and mentoring from a little bit more of an intensive and, and kind of different place. And um, maybe, Sarah, are you, are you with us? I'm still okay. I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Sarah. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Never know who I'm going to be able to pull out of the void here. Um, <laughs> so, Sarah, um, you have been working with and, and researching um, the National Guard Youth Challenge uh, Program, which to me is one of the more interesting uh, mentoring programs that we have out there. Um, for folks who don't know, the Challenge Program is. is actually run through the National Guard um, kind of around the country. There's a generous amount of federal funding that kind of supports that work. Um, and it's kind of a quasi-military residential setting um, for these young people. Um, could you explain for folks a little bit about kind of how challenge works? And then, you know, yeah. the thing I was most interested in is, you know, how do you do mentoring in kind of this residential setting and, and transitioning out of that. Um, we hear, we talk about that a little bit in the world of um, reentry and, and serving incarcerated juveniles, but, um, you know, challenge is a little bit different from even that. So can you talk a little bit about their model and, and kind of what you're learning about that? Yeah, so the challenge program is a program specifically for young people who've dropped out of high school, ages 16 through 18. And as you said, it includes it includes two phases, a residential phase, which really is this quasi-military model where young people are living on a, generally a military base for five months. They're engaging in GED classes as well as physical activities in this very highly structured lifestyle, really trying to kind of make a, make a serious change in the trajectory in their lives. Um, and really the reason that the National Guard Youth Challenge Program included the mentoring program mentoring component is because we know that often, particularly for residential programs, that while you know, these young people might be able to change their ways while they're there, once they return to their communities, a lot of those effects and gains are lost. So they added this mentoring component, and the mentors are matched with young people during the residential phase. And then really the mentoring component becomes central during the post-residential phase, which is a year where they return to their communities and their mentor supports them to pursue educational and occupational goals. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about this program is instead of using the traditional model, model of mentoring that we often think about of assigning a volunteer mentor to a young person, instead you have the youth choose someone to be their mentor who they already know. So they're choosing from the adults within their social network. It could be teachers, extended family members, coaches, family friends. And in some ways, I, it's, we're working with a, with a population that often um, you know, has, that hasn't had a lot of positive experiences with adult authority figures and could be really difficult to build a trusting relationship with. But because you have them choose someone who they already care and trust um, before, before they even become a formal mentor, we actually have these young people who are, who really are enthusiastic about these relationships. And really the main complaint we heard about mentors was only if they weren't there enough for these youth, if they you know, didn't call enough, if they didn't come visit enough. 
Yeah, that's, so, I mean, um, so I mean, I think in terms of what we've seen in um, our, our studying of this program, and I should mention this is really the just the initial um, beginnings of evaluating this new model of mentoring. Um, but we see that um, I think probably one of the number one findings is just that these relationships tend to last a long time. So in, in line with um, you know, the Blue Ribbon Program, the Friends of Children Program, where we're seeing how much of a difference it makes if mentors stay involved in the lives of children for many years, um, that compared to you know, a traditional Big Brothers Big Sisters program. Some of my previous research has been on these programs where often less than half of relationships last even one year. Here we see that three years later, still 75, still more than half of the relationships were intact, and um, more than three quarters stayed in touch through the full post-residential year. So we really see that these relationships tend to be enduring. Um, we also found that even within this youth-initiated mentoring model, that we asked the young people how they chose their mentors. If it was if they chose them mostly on their own, if family members helped them choose, um, or if challenge staff helped them choose. And we found that over half of them said they chose their mentors on their own. And these relationships were the ones that were far more likely to stay in contact. So I think we're seeing kind of the role of giving youth autonomy and choosing someone who they think would be a good match for them. Often um, these people tend to be more often of a similar racial and ethnic, ethnic background from them, often neighbors in kind of physical proximity so they keep in touch. And again, this seemed to be a very strong predictor of more enduring relationships. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I've heard of other uh, mentoring programs kind of um, taking that approach where they encourage young people to identify their own mentors. You know, the idea being that um, you're building on something that's existing, you're not starting from, you know, completely scratch. Um, but, you know, there's also some trade-offs for that. And, and one of the things that I've noted about that is that, you know, that may keep a young person from kind of receiving some of the other benefits of a mentor in terms of expanded social circles or exposure to new things. And I, I'd like to bring George back in here for a second. And, and George, I know some of your research around the ribbon is, is focused on, you know, the ways in which these mentors kind of build the, the social mobility and social capital of young people being served. So I'm kind of open that you two could talk a little bit about, you know, the, the choice that programs have to make around, you know, is it better to expose the young person to new things and build you know, something that's new, or do you build on kind of existing strengths? Um, well, the, in the Blue Ribbon model, um, you build on strengths. Um, and that, you know, at least in the data we have, seems to be uh, pretty effective. The, the mentors themselves have a, um, they're generally not advised to take on the instructional role. But the, the mentors themselves adapt to um, where the kids are. So we see um, in the interviews mentors saying, well, there's this math thing. And so they stepped in and doing some math tutoring for you know uh, three months or whatever. Um, they also talk about just being with the kid. Um, and, uh, and so if it's a male, it might be sporting events. If it's, if it's um, uh, someone else, they may be going to different kinds of cultural events or arts events. Um, one of the things that I think is um, most fascinating about this uh, relationship between the mentor and the mentee is the role of the parent here. Um, and our parents um, talk a lot about how hard it is to trust. You know, in most mentors in the BRMA program are cross race, um, and I don't. And the parents talk about I'm giving over my child to someone who I don't really know, and they're going away first. And so this building of trust with the parents turns out to be a very important um, as aspect of the relationship. Um, so it's, it's really a three-part thing. What the mentor does with the child, what the mentor and parent work out. And clearly there are many ways in which the parent and mentor can agree to work together or to separate their, what they do. Um, but uh, for us, 
the, the stuff we see in our uh, our data is the mentors that step forward and engage that take responsibility to be consistent and that word comes back a lot in the interviews that we've done to be in consistent relationship with the student to that check in with the parent um, really seem to move the relationship forward um, now um, we're talking about mentoring duration we've done one analysis that showed that um, our best, best proxy in the data set that we have is number of mentors that the smaller the number of mentors um, the more likely kids are going to have gains in reading scores it doesn't work out so well in math but it works out in reading um, and I have to admit as a as the you know paid skeptic that we're not quite sure why this would necessarily come over in reading except that we also have many mentors talking about one of their activities being just simply to sit and read with their with their mentee so I what happens with the mentors is it's not a program that the mentors do with the kids they have a sensitivity to the kids they have a sensitivity to what the parents want and then they try to figure out what's the strength how do they work with the, the student um, or the, the mentee in this case and then where do they want to go with it now as a person who works a lot in race and you know I feel like an interloper here and I'm you know talking about mentoring I'm you know I'm when you have the the, the poll up about what are you on mentoring I, I wanted to click beginner um, what I was most impressed about was how much the, the mentors were paying attention to what the student was on about they were talking to the kids a lot and the kids were were hearing things now a lot of the mentors uh, uh, instead of social capital there's certainly there are clear cases of mentors moving kids into relationships with other people uh, or with other agencies or cultural resources and stuff like that which is all part of social capital um, but there's also a whole lot of uh, explanation about how the white world works and how uh, as one white mentor put it I spend a lot of time on manners I spend a lot of time on grammar and one mentor actually explained that you know for Anglos this is important Right, it may not be important in your home culture, but in this one, it's important. So the kids are getting some sense from the from the mentor that there's something different when you go across racial boundaries, and the mentor, in this sense, is brokering uh, across those boundaries. Yeah, I think you you bring up a lot of differences between um, this model and youth initiated mentoring. Um, I think you know definitely the social capital and explicitly teaching young people how to code switch and go back and forth between kind of the dominant and the press cultures is really important. Um, I also think it sounds like with this program that mentors you know, have 12 hours of training, they have a lot of support. Um, I know there's been quite a bit of research, particularly by Renee Spencer, looking at how often cultural insensitivity, insensitivity and bringing in a mentor from another race, race class, um, ethnic background, that if they don't have the right training in how to talk about these things, that this can be a cause for mentoring relationships to fall apart. And, and it can be possible for mentors actually to do damage. Um, so I think that when these conversations are productive, then, they're, then it, it can be a really helpful experience for young people. But I also think that there's uh, a serious risk. Um, and you brought up also just the question of families trusting these, these mentors who often are coming from a different racial background. I think one of the strengths of youth-initiated mentoring, although I'll also talk about the limitations, um, but one of the strengths is that generally these mentors are people who the family already knows and trusts. So we, we heard a lot of stories of, you know, uh, a young person's mother would call the mentor and say, you know, I think he's slipping up again. Can you can you give him a call and check in? So that this kind of triangle between the family, the mentor, and the young person that you talked about is a real strength that you can initiate in mentoring. We also found that 83% of our mentors were of the same race or racial or ethnic background as the mentee. Um, and in our interviews, a lot of the um, the mentees talked about this being a real strength, and it meant that they felt like their mentors could understand them better. 
they were a role model, but a role model who's coming from a more similar place as them. Um, so I think that, that that ends up being also a serious strength. And I actually think that while I'm aware that in some ways these mentors may not have the same type, type of social capital as a mentor coming from a different community, from maybe um, a more privileged community, that I think it's also important to recognize that these mentors or these communities also have internal social capital. And I sometimes think a risk of traditional mentoring programs where you bring the mentors in from a separate community is that there's almost this implicit assumption that that these communities don't have adults who are mentor material. So I think it's it's important to recognize both that there are some different types of social capital that people from other communities can offer, but also that there's internal social capital to be developed. Um, I, this is George again. I, I would agree entirely, Sarah. What, what I would say is that, um, it, uh, well, first of all, there's some practical limitations with BRMA. It's located in a, uh, you know, a white, upper middle class community. So mm -hmm. in some contexts, It'd be, and, you know, I know from working with Greg over the years that the attempt to, and clearly there are uh, same race mentors, but it's very hard for, for to find that in this community. The other thing I would, the thing that's intriguing to me is, could we in fact create mentoring pairs, right, where the mentors themselves would be moving across this divide and mm -hmm. talking about this? The when we are yeah. analyzing the interviews of kids and families and looking at what kinds of social cap, what kind of capitals, we have many different kinds of capitals that we'll talk yeah. about next week, what kinds of capitals the kids bring, the parents bring, the mentors bring, and uh, what kinds of capitals same race mentors bring versus different race, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different mix. But it would be really yeah. interesting to think about how could you bridge this um, um, you know, this, the race divide in, at the mentoring level as opposed to mentor to mentee or family level. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating idea. See, we're, we're innovating. Right we have training activities that um, focus on, on that, and I think that in the best mentoring relationships, um, the mentor realizes quickly that they're going to learn as much out of uh, and gain as much out of the relationship as their mentee is. And that's where really when you're able to get people onto a developmental track. Great. This is excellent, you guys. Uh, you know, some of this, these issues around race and um, trust and, and whatnot reminds me a little bit of, of some research that I believe Bernadette Sanchez presented um, a few years ago at, at the Summer Institute. Um, and she was looking at, you know, those issues of, of trust and, and you know, she found, I believe, that, that kind of attitudes that participants brought to the program, um, you know, kind of just their internal opinions and their level of, I, I believe the term was cultural trust or distrust, um, was kind of predictive of the closeness of the relationship that they were able to build. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's kinds of trade-offs around, you know, um, what do you do when somebody, um, you know, has an inherent distrust, perhaps, or it would be much harder for them to build a relationship kind of across that divide? Um, I want to open things up a little bit here. Um, uh, Tom's, trying, Tom. Tom's trying to jump in. <laughs> Mike, I, Go ahead, Tom. I think at this point it might be interesting to, to bring in Gabe if he's yes. available, because he has done research on a program called Cool Girls, which um, it, it is, is focusing on um, students that, uh, you know, a very, a very specific group of students, um, uh, early adolescent African American girls. So he, he's looked at uh, how you, you know, design a, a very tailored program to, to meet the needs of, of um, a group that, that where one of the considerations is, is race. Okay. Hi, this is Gabe. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Great. No technical difficulties this time. Um, so, so yeah, I've had the, I've had the um, privilege of working with this organization called Cool Girls Incorporated since about 1998, I think. Um, and, and it's been a, 
a, a real privilege because I've gotten to be, um, you know, really a, a, an outsider looking in and to this to this wonderful program that um, has been uh, ongoing and has been sort of con continually evolving since it began back in I think 1989 or so, um, and. Uh, you know, it's a it's a program that's always in, incorporated mentoring into part of what it does, but has always really seen itself much more broadly as a as a youth development program. Um, that that um, you know began with with uh, working with with girls uh, from neighborhoods that have very few resources. Um, for you know, after-school programs, for recreational programs, and things like that. And you know, way back in in um, in yeah, 1989, uh, when when it was founded, that you know, they they started this program with the idea of here are these here are these young girls who who have a lot of needs, and let's figure out what needs they they have and how to do something about it. So it started with a with the idea of of doing good, and, and among the things that that um, you know they came up with were that were that uh, the girls didn't have a lot of role models as, in, as far as um, as far as career development, as far as seeing what what their life options might be, and so they they very um, They've very consciously sought to recruit uh, mentors from the business community, from colleges, from you know the, the the kinds of places that they thought girls you know ought to be exposed to and, and ought to have some uh, some connection to and some feeling that that's a place that they could go in their futures as well. So um, so mentoring became a part of it and the way that it's evolved over time is that the, the program is a is a um, is a the main part of the program is a is a uh, after school school based program that meets once a week has um, life skills curriculum does some academic support and those sorts of things um, the, the cool scholars program is is the the name of the academic support part that happens there, and then the and then a sort of accompanying uh, piece is, is Cool Sisters, which is their one-to-one -one mentoring program um, that, in, in a lot of ways, operates very much the way that you know I imagine Big Brothers and Big Sisters and other freestanding mentoring programs operate and I think you know for them one of the things I'm going to be talking about at the at the um, Institute next week is that for them a real challenge is how to integrate the two how to make sure that what happens in the mentoring gets reflected in what happens at the at the girls club what happens in girls clubs um, that that information finds its way to the mentors as well um, so uh, not not sure what else what else you want me to to say about it at this point. Well, Gabe, you know I'm glad that you're you were able to get on with us here. Um, I wanted to ask you um, kind of, uh, and I'll open this up to the entire panel as well. Um, I think one of the things that the field is struggling with right now a little bit around mentoring is is you know mentoring within the context of these other services other. You know, whether those are academic supports or um, connections with other uh, supports for the young person, how can programs that are kind of using mentoring in an embedded way, you know, how can they um, position mentors to kind of be effective? What role do mentors play in those types of programs? Is there any general advice that, that you all would give programs that, that offer mentoring and other things? about how to position the mentor to be most effective. Yeah, well, I, I think so. Um, you know, back in, back in the early 2000s, I was asked to, to um, contribute a chapter for the first edition of um, Dubois and Karcher's handbook, and that was the topic that I was, that I was given to write on. 
And at the time when we did our review, we, we um, found some programs but had a hard time um, had, had a hard time locating a lot of programs that were doing that, that were bringing mentoring in and trying to, to um, integrate it within the, a broader context like that. Um, what we found at the time was, was that they really broke into two kinds of categories. One was programs like Cool Girls, where mentoring is a component among many components of a broader program. And the other was, was um, much like what we've been hearing about on this, on this um, webinar, programs in which mentors uh, were delivering the programming or were really connecting kids to other programming in a much more active and much more integrated sort of way. And at the time when we did the review, um, it, it was hard to, to um, without getting into the technical details, I had to say it was, it was hard to, to draw any really firm conclusions about how do you make this effective. But one of the things that did seem, seem interesting, at least, was that those more integrated programs where the mentor was really very much a part of or maybe even the, the main vehicle through which other program uh, parts were, were delivered, all of those were effective. And of the, of the programs where mentoring was just a piece of, of what was going on, some were effective and some weren't. So I, I'd say probably the, the biggest piece of advice would be, um, would be making sure that what you're doing really integrates the mentor into into what's happening with the program overall. Um, so, you know, you might start with the idea that, well, we know how to do these, you know, we can do skills training, we can do um, community service, and we know that we can achieve these kinds of outcomes with the kids. But if we threw a mentoring program in there on top of it, maybe we could get other outcomes, or maybe we could strengthen the ones that we already have. And I would caution against doing that without thinking very clearly and very um, specifically about how exactly is that mentoring piece going to fit in. I think that's something that Cool Girls has struggled with all of the time that I've been working with them and, and probably since their inception. Um, and, and I think in some ways they've done it effectively, in other ways um, they, you know, they've continued to struggle with it. Um, I would say another another challenge is um, in the youth development field, we think that doing a broader array of things is good because it gets sort of gets at a more sort of holistic picture. On the other hand, there's a resource issue as well. If you try to do too much with limited resources, you end up not doing any of it very well. So I think that's a really important balancing act. Um, this is this is George. If I could join in, uh, sure. uh, BRMA kind of starts with the mentors and adds programs. So I think it's a kind of gives you the reverse model that Gabe's talking about. Right. Um, what I would say from you know talking to a lot of people over the past year is that um, while I have no doubts that mentoring does many amazing things, I'm not sure mentoring. I don't think we want to say that mentoring can do all. What I want to, I think we want to really focus on is what is that mentoring does really well, and I think in the blue ribbon case, um, we see these relationships that build that you know when they work, you know, kind of go to start. When they work well, they're wonderful. Um, when and when it's built into advocacy, that is, the mentor knows a role that's beyond you know let's expose the kid to you know more cultural resources or whatever. Uh, I think that's also good, but I'm. I'm reluctant to, you know, it's just a, as I said, the, the, the cynic in me says, I'm not sure mentoring is the solution to all the problems of the youth that we are, we want to work with here. Uh, so that's what I would say. I, would add, um, I couldn't agree just, more, I, George. <laughs> and just to add, um, I think a related issue is that the, again, the challenge program is a slightly different model, but I think one thing I was impressed by both in our quantitative data and in the interviews I conducted with youth was how, how effective mentoring seemed as a strategy to um, 
to help the issue of erosion of effects um, for a residential program. And I, I also do wonder about the implications for reentry after incarceration or issues like that. Um, and, and there were two parts of this. That um, the mentoring component in the National Guard Youth Challenge Program was really created to focus on the post-residential phase once youth return to their communities. But actually what we heard in the interviews was how powerful the mentoring component was in helping them stick with the residential phase. That a number of the young people we talked to said, I would have dropped out of the program or I would have gotten kicked out of the program if it hadn't been for the phone calls from my mentor, for the visits, when, when you talked about the mentor as, quote, a little piece of home. So I think that if we think about the way mentoring, again, the way mentoring can be in an effective way, um, incorporated into other interventions. And I think um, its role, particularly for residential programs, could be quite powerful. Yeah, no, and we've done a little bit of work here with uh, Youth Build USA, and, and we've also tended to encourage them to kind of think of mentors as this transitional thing that will kind of help with that erosion of, of gains. But similar to what you found, Sarah, we found a lot of the mentees saying, you know, I never would have made it through the program in the first place without the support of my yeah. mentor along the way. So um, I want to make sure that we um, leave some time here for questions from uh, the audience. So I'm going to check in here with Sarah and Marissa. Do we have any, any questions for the panel? Uh, we have a couple questions. Um, we have one question for uh, for Sarah, and this may not be something you can answer. It sounds like a programmatic question. Uh, but Rebecca is asking, will youth be accepted into the program without a mentor? We have taken calls at Virginia Mentoring Partnership from parents who are trying to find a mentor for their child so they can apply for the National Guard program. Oh, that's interesting. So um, so I can try to answer that, although um, I, I don't, I'm probably not the best person to do that. But And there's a lot of variation in how the mentoring component is implemented on um, this program runs in 29 states, so so it varies across states. But generally, in most programs, if, uh, if the youth or the family can't come up with a mentor themselves, then there's a mentor coordinator with the program who, um, who will help the, the youth and family identify a mentor. And most programs have a pool of volunteer mentors who will, um, will mentor youth if they can't find a mentor. In terms of our numbers, we found only about 5% of um, youth end up needing help from challenge staff in finding a mentor, but they do have that if they need it. Again, I don't know if this applies to every single site, but that, that's kind of the overarching policy, um, at least, that, that I've heard. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and then I know we have a poll in progress, so if you've clicked off your screen, come back and uh, give us your answers for a quick poll about how do you feel about paying adults to mentor youth. And it, while we're waiting for more people to vote, we have one more question. Um, Major is asking, I think this is a question for Gabe. Um, he's interested in knowing something about, a little bit more about group, met, group mentoring. Um, how effective and how effective was it, and was it faith-based? Maybe this is a particular program that maybe you were speaking about. Yeah, um, I, I have also worked with, with group mentoring. I, I had a program that I ran um, through a local high school for a number of years, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an interesting school that, that uh, it was not faith-based. It was a school-based program, and the particular issues and challenges um, of the school was it was in a community that uh, was experiencing a huge amount of immigration or immigrants coming from primarily Latin American and Asian countries, but there were students at the school from 50 different countries speaking at least that many different languages uh, and, um, you know, really just kind of trying to adjust to to uh, schooling in the United States. Something like 60% 60 of the students at the school were immigrants at the time. Um, and so the, the program was developed uh, 
as as a with the, with the goals of helping kids kind of learn the system a little bit, sort of socialize to what was happening in the school and um, and make friends and feel more connection to the school and that sort of thing. Uh, was it successful? It was. It was a wildly popular program for a number of years. We we um, we used um, undergraduate students who were psychology majors and earned course credit um, for doing that. So so part of the appeal was that it also had a connection to the to the university. Um, students really enjoyed doing it. Um, the the both the undergrad and the and the um, high school students that participated, um, we found some positive some some positive effects. We saw improvements in behavior at school, so kids were getting in trouble a little bit less, um, and some of the kids, especially the immigrant kids, were showing improvements in uh, in uh, engagement at school. Things like joining clubs and enjoying their classes more and you know those sorts of things um, but overall we didn't find a lot of very very strong positive overall effects what we did find was that um, was that when when the kids told us um, things about their about their particular groups that they were cohesive that there was a lot of sharing and mutual help going on and that they really felt connected to the mentor in those groups, we found very positive effects. In the groups that didn't work so well, um, we, we found not so positive and even some sort of backsliding kinds of effects. So, so what we came away with was a feeling that group mentoring can work really well if, if it's done right, but we didn't know quite yet how to do it right. Um, that, that was our own experience. Since then, I've written a, a a chapter for the upcoming handbook that really summarizes the research that's out there, and I would say sort of a qualified yes, it's a fairly effective approach. All right. Thanks, Gabe. Um, this is April. I just wanted I I threw this poll up here so we could see that, and then um, just wanted to let everybody know that uh, this was one of the things that would have come up when we talked to Mark Eddy, and he's been trying all hour to get his audio to work, but he did send me an email and requested that, you know, maybe Tom could speak to this a little bit on the Friends for on the Friends of the Children perspective. But, you know, this question of paying mentors or these different models, um, you know, that's where you know, sometimes people are really comfortable with it or you're really uncomfortable and there's kind of this spectrum here. But thinking about all the different ways that that mentoring can and cannot work. And we also entered in the in the chat panel a little bit about you know, our after-school staff um, or other youth workers are those also mentors, and so getting some differing uh, opinions there as well. But I don't know, Tom, if you want to say anything. I feel bad, so bad for Mark trying to get in here for this hour. He just got back from Costa Rica on a trip with fifth-grade kids <laughs> and um, spent all this time trying to get in here today. But right. So, so as I mentioned, I. I, I was associated with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and I still do a lot of work with BBBSA. But I'm also on the board, the National Board of Directors for Friends of the Children, which is a very innovative um, model where they visit um, kindergarten classrooms of distressed schools and, and observe the students and, and really um, identify the students that, that are in greatest need of support. and. Um, and then they they invite those students into the program and make a 12-year commitment to provide them with a paid professional mentor uh, until they they complete high school and um, they see each other. I mean, the mentors uh, have a caseload, as it were, of of about eight mentees that they see at least four hours a week and they really do become um, advocates for them uh, and, and do whatever is needed to help these help support the, the mentees um, and the other interesting thing is you know again they, they are really looking for the, the very most vulnerable children in the community and nothing that the, the children can do that get them um, 
kicked out of the program. So they're with them through them was an open door um, them to, to have the mentoring. And um, Mark is conducting a randomized trial to see um, you know how how effective this is in, in altering the um, the life circumstances of these of these young people. Um, there have been now several graduating classes uh, from the program here in Portland and very high rates of, of high school completion, many of them going on to secondary, post-secondary education, very few getting involved in, in uh, the criminal justice system, very few having early um, pregnancies. Those are the main things they're trying to uh, prevent. And, um, and it's really remarkable compared to the um, experiences of their own parents, um, you know, which, which um, indicate how how much risk they've faced in their lives. So, um, my my thinking is that um, there are some people that really have a talent for working with children, and they are are very dedicated to that, and really want to spend their time in that way, and can provide amazing support and guidance. And in our society, it's wonderful if we can allow them to do that important work um, as a full-time job and, um, and, and use their talents uh, for, for promoting youth development um, with, with the youth in the community that, that need it the most. And there are some things that um, you, know, you, you have to learn by doing it, and, and they're, they're mentoring you know, 36 hours a week and, and really get good at it. And um, I, I, I think that it's, it's wonderful when there are volunteers from the community who will take time out of their own schedules to, to get involved with youth. But um, in some cases, for some children facing really um, great odds, having a professional in their corner really can, can do wonderful things. Um, and, I, and I think... Um, you know, this, the other way to look at it is there was a question about um, whether youth workers and coaches and others that have a job interacting with, with children are mentors. And I think that um, the more people, both adults and children, who become comfortable with the idea of mentoring and understanding the roles of mentors and what they can do and what they can't do, and um, the better we are. Um, and, and ideally, there would be a career ladder for mentors, um, you know, where they might volunteer with the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. They might find that they're very good at it and want to be, do more and get involved with a, a, a program that maybe um, works with, with, with more difficult cases and maybe become a professional mentor at some point. In, in other ways they might step down the ladder and say, you know, it, it was too much for me to handle. I was in over my head, so I want something more structured, um, like maybe a, a, a local tutoring um, program for one hour a week in the school. So um, I think there's a whole range of, of um, ways that youth, I mean, that adults can get involved in, in the lives of youth and, and that, you know, we should be looking at and promoting all of them because there's a need to, to reestablish those intergenerational connections. If I can join in too, in, in, uh, for some of the BRMA mentors, um, it's also important to remember that some of these mentors are actually on fixed incomes. And some of the, you know, the activities may or may not be expensive, but it would be, I think it's important to, to follow Tom's logic, there may be some people for whom a little bit of money, maybe not so much in, in the case of the, of the mentors in BRMA, not so much as pay for them, but to sponsor some kinds of activities might be fully appropriate as well. Uh, well, this is, this is everybody um, oh. on the panel today. I know. We're OK, we've, we've got a. Are we wrapping up? We've got one. We've got one really good question, and I'm not sure if we're going to go a little bit extra since we got started late. April, would you like to sure. take that call? Yeah, we um, 
with all the technical difficulties, if anybody can bear with us just for a few minutes, I'm going to click through um, the slides as we get some, we, everybody can't, kind of came on late here with some comments and some questions, but again, apologizing for technical difficulties, but we'll keep moving through the slides and um, keep the recording going right now just for a few minutes. Um, and because we do have some great comments and questions, if that's okay, understanding if if somebody has to go at one fifteen, that's 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 always okay. I just want to be sure I have a chance at the very end to say something to answer your initial question. Great. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a question which I think could really uh, apply to just about any researcher, and and probably this is something that many programs have been thinking about. Um, Christine says that she's part of a small rural one-to-one -one mentoring program which has a stable base of consistent mentors. We're trying to expand our program but are having great difficulty recruiting new mentors, which I know every program has a problem with. Uh, we are thinking that some time-limited groups, maybe for teen girls, may be a good way to encourage volunteers to step forward and then progress into traditional mentoring relationships. So since we're talking about traditional and non-traditional, um, for anyone who wants to jump in, what are your thoughts on starting off with something that's maybe more non-traditional as a way to motivate and, and inspire these volunteers to maybe take on a more traditional uh, formal mentoring? This is Greg Meyer. I think that's a, a brilliant way to approach that. Um, I think you will find some people that will sign up for a more limited volunteer commitment, and then you have the possible added benefit of having natural mentoring relationships develop because they'll have an opportunity to know the students prior to moving into a mentoring relationship. And uh, I would love to, to see how that worked and something I can imagine that we would do as well. Uh, this is George. Um, I would also encourage people to think about more specific kinds of mentoring. Um, I, I play old time music and it's a, a an open, it's basically a jam genre, so anyone who shows up. But I was thinking about, when reading this question, I was thinking about, uh, in the pattern there, what it is is someone who doesn't know how to play this music shows up and and someone will pick them up about music. But then you'll see them a year or two later and they're connected in all aspects of their life. So I, I think it, it might also help us to think about, are there some things that people do that they're really into that some youth might want to really be into too that might be an entryway? And this is Sarah. I, I think um, I, I'm definitely not advocating, you know, uprooting the traditional mentoring model and replacing it with youth-initiated mentoring, but I do think that a strength of youth-initiated mentoring is that youth tend to be more effective recruiters than, um, than program agencies, and I live in Boston, signs on the subway saying, be a mentor. So I do think that one of the benefits of youth-initiated mentoring is that it often accesses populations of mentors who may not sign up to be a volunteer mentor, but when approached by a young person who says, you're important to me and I really want you to play a bigger role in my life and you know, helping me meet my goals, that very few adults say no to that. And this is Greg again. You know, another um, thing that's related to that is that parents are very effective mentors and uh, our parents when we survey them on what they think the program could do to improve, the most common response that they give is to recruit more mentors and serve more students, which of course we would love to. And so we've enlisted some parents in helping to recruit because they feel that it's an easy way to give back to a program that is already benefiting their child. Sarah, do you have any other comments or, or questions that we... Um, oh shoot, I never hid that poll. I've been showing all of your pictures and all kinds of uh, <laughs> slides and working really hard at my end, but you're still looking at that poll. I'm sorry. Um, any other comments we or have, questions? Uh, we have one last question. Um, okay. I think this is a question for uh, Mark or perhaps Tom, if uh, Mark is still not able to connect with us. Um, I believe Kathy was talking about the Friends of the Children program, and she's wanting to know what is the burnout rate for mentors in this type of program? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
the, the, it, it's really a model where the, um, the program makes a commitment to the, um, to the child to always provide a mentor. Um, there have been many examples of, of mentors who have stayed with that, a child for 12 years. There are some mentors that um, have, have gone, you know, are still with the program in, in its 15th year. So um, some have demonstrated great longevity. But the, the fact is that most of the youth in the program will have um, a few mentors along the way, you know, two or three or four mentors to get them through the 12 years. Um, I think there was a, a, an average of, of seven years um, that stayed. Um, when they hire a friend, a new mentor, they ask for a three-year commitment. Um, so, you know, they do have a, a, good, a good record in terms of sticking with the youth. But again, there's, there's a sense of um, making sure that the youth identifies with the program, that they belong to the program and will always have support from the program, even if there is a transition among mentors. Right. Okay, well, like we said, there's also the opportunity to continue the conversation on the mentoring forums. Uh, our next webinar uh, in August will be focused on training school-based mentors. So we've got um, Dr. Michael Karcher, and we also have um, a panelist from Youth Friends in Kansas, who um, a trainer who provides technical assistance to those sites about how to um, uh, train specifically school-based mentors. So that should be a, a great one. Um, you'll get this information on how to access the, the PDF of the slides here and also the webinar recording. And there were a couple people who jumped in late and wondered if they could um, get some of that information. But again, to just continue the conversation um, on the mentoring forums as well. So if you um, just sign up and, and log in, this is my login training institute here. but um, sign up, log in, and you can um, keep that conversation going. We know a bunch of you are going to keep the conversation going next week, and I think this is evidence of how you might have wondered before, how can you keep this talk about this for an entire week? But um, it, it happens. And Tom, I know you had something to say at the end, so maybe I'll right. turn it over I, to you. You know, at the very beginning, Mike asked me how people that are not able to attend the full Summer Institute can, can learn more about the research uh, presented during, during the week. And um, as he noted, he always produces a wonderful report that summarizes uh, what, the, what the discussions covered. But in addition, we now have a, a symposium that um, is open to anybody who wants to register it's on Friday, actually next Friday, um, the 27th, and we use the TED Talk format. So each of the research fellows plus some additional um, guest speakers um, sort of hit the highlights of, of, of their message um, in, a, in a 15 to 20 minute talk. And we do videotape those. We have a professional photographer, and we make those available on our website. So um, we, we started doing that last year. You can see about a dozen of you know, 15 to 20 minute videos of the speakers uh, we had last year. And um, you're, anybody is invited to sign up for that and, and join us next Friday in a, in a nice theater here on campus. Um, and within a few months, we will um, be posting those talks uh, from, the, from the researchers you just heard today. Thank you again for featuring uh, the Summer Institute uh, on this webinar. We're very happy to have you. Um, April, did you have anything else you wanted to add? You might be muted at this point. Yep. Just thank you so much, to everybody, for bearing with us through the audio issues. And hopefully we won't have that again. We had a lot of panelists. and. Um, We'll see how that goes, but um, have, have a great time next week in Portland and look forward to checking out the videos and hope to see lots of you next month to talk about training school-based mentors. Thank you. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.